This, again, is um, to do with moisture. So the, the material itself is kiln dried um, uh, before it goes into the press. And um, to explain, we work with this company, KLH, for lots of different reasons. When we built this little building I was talking about before, we built it in South London with a different firm. And then after we loved the material, after we loved the process, we then went and we researched all the different companies that made this material. And we liked this company for a couple of reasons. Three reasons. One is because the whole place was run by people who are uh, engineers, timber technologists, and not salespeople. And they really knew what they were talking about. The other thing is all the offcuts from the factory, all the windows that you saw cut out, all the doors you see cut out, they all go into a massive biomass generator, powers the whole factory. The factory is off-grid. So nothing goes in. So it's all powered by these, by the offcuts of the material, and which it can be because the adhesive is solvent and formaldehyde free. So it's all powered by that. And then even then, they power the two little villages where all the workers live, just down further down the valley. It's like sound of music, by the way. <laughs> it's so useful. And uh, you know, so they run this little Charlie and the Chocolate Factory venture down there, and the whole thing works very nicely. And then not only that, but then they build it for you as well. So then you don't have to worry about chains of command or chains of responsibility because you don't have to worry about where the timber's coming from or if they know how to put it together or who they are because they're coming, they cut the timber down, they bring it into the factory, they make it into panels and they come there and erect it. So that made me feel safe. Anyway, back to this. So what they do is they kill and dry the material to 8%. Now of course, and that gives us a maximum compression in terms of, uh, a maximum movement in terms of about 2 millimeters on a floor panel when the <coughs> dries out and nothing on a wall panel. So this is an incredibly stable and tight building. We had, of course, as all good anecdotes go, when we were building this building, we had more rain in April than we'd ever had before. And blah, blah, blah. So we had, at one point, um, about an inch of water lying on the floor slab, which, we kind of like, which they were brushing off the side of the building. And within two weeks, the timber itself had returned from about 16% moisture content, had returned back to the 8% of the stability that it originally had. So over these um, nine stories, we have 24 millimeters with regard to movement over nine stories. And sure enough, when the building was finished and the threshold to the staircase, which was independent to the rest of the building was finished, you could literally roll a penny over the threshold because the Austrians knew what they were doing. Um, stability, P delta forces. So as I was saying before, when the wind pushes against this building, the load parts of this building pass straight through the floor slabs and down into the ground. So it's incredibly efficient in terms of its structure as well. With regard to progressive collapse, I don't know if you, if you um, have the same progressive collapse issues here. In the 70s, we built lots of buildings out of prefabricated concrete, and then people burnt cakes and ovens, and the panel fell aside, and the building fell down, and people were killed, it was a nightmare. So we're very strictly educated with regard to progressive collapse. So roughly, in architect speak, you have to be able to take out about 15% of the walls and the building on any one floor, and the building has to be able to still stand up. We did it to about 30% in this building. Now, as I was saying, this building, it's very, very simply put together. It is walls that sit on top of floors, and they're screwed in with galvanized angle brackets, which are 75 mil, and then they're screwed in with a four inch nail, uh, 100 mil nail, 100 mil screw, sorry, with a cordless drill. So it's incredibly simple. We have some localized mechanical fixings where we have a little bit more compression, but part, but in gen and on the slab edges here, but in general, it's just these angle brackets that are doing all the work. So you can see, with regards to the structure plan here, this is our uh, these are our big floor panels here, our floor slabs, and this is, as I say, 12.8 metres. And you can see, so you can take out these walls here, and still the end of it's being carried here, and then being carried on the edges of the slabs by a lap joint on each one. So each floor slab is lap jointed across. The other thing you can see is how easy it is to move these party walls across with regard to moving the plan around the building. So acoustics was our, was our big concern, really. I think it, our concern... Primarily because if, you, if you're squishing loads of people into one building in a high-density high urban situation, you've got people above you, people below you, and people either side of you, I think it's enough to make anybody go completely mental. If everybody can kind of, they know, you know what so-and-so is doing upstairs, what so-and-so is watching on TV downstairs, etc., etc. So acoustics were a very big issue for us. Um, we built in Austria with the Austrians a, a, a test lab for the acoustics and retested them. We have pretty stringent acoustic laws in the UK um, due to our Catholic music taste. And so we have our own, we have our own little drum and bass acoustic law. And um, we were, are required 45 decibel sound protection between, between units. We achieved, 
in Austria 48 and, and post-construction, we actually got between 52 and 56 decibels between units. So this stuff is incredibly soundproof. It's really fabulous. But what we did is we, um, we got a compressed insulation, so like a carry mat kind of thing that we lay across all the timber. And then over that, we put a, a 55 mil um, polymer screed over that. And then we used that screed to run underfloor heating in, so that then provided us with thermal mass across the units. So this is actually, this is a section here, can't quite see the edge of it, but this is a section here through the external skin of the building. It's very simple, goes up very easily. Once the external um, is on here, then you, then you um, staple the membrane on the outside. You run a, a number of aluminum T-sections down the outside of the building, then you wodge the insulation, that's technical. You wodge the insulation onto the T-section, then you take it up, then you run the channels down, and then you put on your own screen cladding. Very easy. Um, so fire, it's the question my dad always asks me about, and about compartmentation. So we have, in the UK, I'm disappointed. Fire, always water. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we have a, a compartmentation law in the UK, which means, in um, common buildings, which means that, oh, shoot. Yeah. So um, we have this compartmentation, so we separate each apartment an hour from the other apartment, and then two hours from the staircase. And then inside we have a little half hour zone around the hallway here. And what we did is we went to the fire department and discussed with them the charring rates of timber. So the timber is completely predictable in how it burns. It burns at about 0.7 millimeters, well, 0.67 millimeters a minute. The spruce, this European light that we use, burns at 0.67 millimeters a minute. So every laminate is a half hour fire protection for the structure. So we were able to demonstrate that to them. Also, because we were very keen not to have any fire retardant in the material um, or anything else but this inert adhesive and the timber itself, we um, used plasterboard in order to prevent surface spread of flame. So between the plasterboard and the charring rate of the material itself, we were able to achieve these levels of compartmentation. Now this is the building going up. This is a little time lapse of filling up. So these are our cores here, you can see. And the floor goes round, and they're insulated. And then it starts going, you can see it's slowly becoming spray. This is our mobile crane here, <coughs> still no sunshine. And then it, it, uh, the, the private for sale call sales as well. Now, how this building worked was, well, let me play again, I played a lot. <laughs> how this building worked was, on a Tuesday morning, four Austrians arrived in a truck with a whole load of wall panels, and on Tuesday put wall panels up, and on Wednesday another load of wall panels came and the Austrians put those up, and then on Thursday morning floor panels arrived, the Austrians put them on top of the walls, laid them out, and then went back home on Thursday afternoon. And on Thursday night they were tucked up in bed in Austria, and they did that one floor a week for nine weeks. So they built the whole building in 27 days. Four guys. In traditional Austrian Carpenter wear, which is black corduroy trousers with a double vent and a, uh, and a sort of a white blouse thing that you don't talk to them about. And then when they finished the building, they stood on top of the lift shaft and they recited a poem in German that they'd written during the construction process, <laughs> which was chilling. <laughs> I don't speak German. 